Hey, what's up everyone? This is Music Tech Help Guy and welcome to part 36 of my ultimate guide to Logic Pro. If you've watched videos one through 35, you can kind of think of those 35 videos as its own self-contained course. So basically everything you need to know to have a good working knowledge of how to operate and use Logic. Starting with this video, we're gonna move on to MIDI and electronic music production. So you'll see that I've changed up the title here in the lower right to reflect that. And along the way, I'll demonstrate various production techniques that are relevant to electronic music. Before we get into the Logic tutorials, I wanna spend the rest of this video talking about how MIDI messages work, because when we dive into some of the more fine details of MIDI production, there will be certain terminology and control values you'll need to understand in order to work with some of these more advanced MIDI functions. So first, let's review some of the basics and talk about the history of MIDI. MIDI is an acronym for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, and it's a communications protocol, a digital computer language, that allows musical devices to communicate with each other. And it was first introduced in 1983 by Dave Smith, the founder of Sequential Circuits. MIDI is open source, it doesn't require any licensing to use it, and it's also a very simple and generic language that can be adopted for a number of different musical and non-musical applications. For example, if you wanted to connect two MIDI synthesizers together, you could do things like play the keyboard on one instrument, but hear the sound from another instrument. This was revolutionary for its time because you no longer needed to have a separate keyboard for each synthesizer in your studio or live rig. You could simply just have one central MIDI keyboard and connect it to multiple sound sources. In the mid and late 80s, you start to see computer-based sequencing applications, including predecessors to Logic Pro, Creator and Notator released by C-Lab, and in the early 90s, the C-Lab programmers formed their own company, eMagic, and released the first versions of Logic. In 2002, Apple acquired eMagic, and the rest is history. Nowadays, hardware synthesizers, while still used by many producers, songwriters, and performers, are far less common in the studio. They've largely been replaced by software synthesizers and other software-based MIDI sequencing tools. Before we jump into MIDI messages and MIDI message structure, I wanna quickly tell you about the sponsor of this video, Boombox. Boombox.io is a brand new audiophile collaboration tool that's perfect for musicians, bands, producers, mixing engineers, really anyone who needs to work on music or audio projects in a collaborative way. Boombox.io allows you to upload your tracks and receive timestamped feedback from collaborators on your project. And all of this is handled securely on the Boombox website. Only collaborators you invite to your project can listen to your tracks and leave feedback. If you're ready to give Dropbox the boot, head over to boombox.io and sign up today to get four gigabytes of free storage. Next, let's break down what a MIDI message consists of and how several of the most common MIDI messages work. Also, I should make sure to mention here that MIDI messages do not send audio information. They only send control data. That's why most MIDI controllers do not generate any sound on their own. They're simply a control source to send MIDI messages to your computer or to a hardware synthesizer. MIDI messages are 8-bit, so they're fairly simple in terms of their resolution. If you take the number two, two represents the two possible states of a bit in binary code, so one or zero, on or off. So if you take two to the power of eight, eight for eight bit, that's two times 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 two, you get 256. That is the maximum resolution for MIDI messages. Well, at least MIDI 1.0 messages. MIDI 2.0, which has been in development since the early 2000s and first demonstrated to the public in 2020, can actually support up to 128-bit messages and has a much higher resolution than MIDI 1.0. But at the time of making this video in 2023, most DAWs are still using MIDI 1.0 for most MIDI control data. So for the purposes of this video, we're gonna break down MIDI messages in terms of MIDI 1.0, because you kind of have to understand how MIDI 1.0 works before you jump into MIDI 2.0. MIDI messages consist of three bytes of information. Technically a byte is 10 bits, but two of those bits are for error correction, and only eight of the bits are used for actually communicating control data. 
So every time you play a note on your MIDI controller, move the modulation wheel, move the pitch bend knob, press the sustain pedal, or move a fader or knob on your MIDI controller, three bytes of information are sent to communicate that message. Most MIDI messages consist of a status byte followed by two data bytes. Earlier, I said that 8-bit messages have a resolution of 256. That's 256 discrete values to send control data. The data bytes use the first half of 256. So data bytes communicate values of 0 to 127, and the status byte communicates data with the second half of that resolution, 128 to 255. So 0 to 255 gives you 256 total discrete values. The reason why most of the MIDI values you see in your DAW are communicated with 0 to 127 is because of the data bytes and the type of information that's sent on the data byte. But first, let's talk about status bytes because a MIDI message means nothing without the status byte. The status byte is used to define the type of MIDI message. So for example, this could be a note on message. If you press a key down on your MIDI controller, that's a note on message. This could also be a control change message, which are used for continuous controllers like knobs and faders, the modulation wheel, or for your sustain pedal. The status byte can also define a pitch bend message, which fun fact, Pitch bend is actually its own separate MIDI message. It's not a control change message, and it's not technically considered a continuous controller. Another type of MIDI message that is its own separate message is aftertouch, also known as channel pressure. But there's actually a second type of aftertouch known colloquially as polyphonic aftertouch, but it's technically called polyphonic key pressure. I'm actually going to do a whole video devoted to aftertouch coming up pretty soon, but for now, just know that aftertouch is a MIDI message that allows you to add additional expression when you bottom out a key on your MIDI controller to engage aftertouch and bring in an additional effect like vibrato. <laughs> or a filter sweep. All of these effects are being turned on because this MIDI controller supports aftertouch. And that's the thing, not all MIDI controllers have aftertouch. Some of them support it and some of them don't. So those are the four, well, really five main MIDI messages that producers and musicians will typically use in a DAW environment like Logic Pro. But what about velocity? What about pitch? Well, velocity and pitch are not actually their own MIDI messages. They're actually components of a note on message, which we'll talk about right now. So let's break down the message structure of the most common type of MIDI message, the note on message. With a note on message, the status byte defines that the message is a note on message. Status bytes also define what MIDI channel you're using, but MIDI channels are not really that applicable in DAWs anymore unless you're using hardware synths in conjunction with your DAW. So I'm gonna kind of gloss over MIDI channels for this video. The data bytes in MIDI messages are what convey the musical data and other types of control data. So in a note on message, the first data byte defines what pitch you're playing, and it conveys pitch using 0 to 127. Now you might recall from a previous video that note number 60 is middle C. So in traditional music, middle C is designated as C4, and in most DAWs, it's designated as C3. As you play notes higher on your keyboard, the MIDI note numbers get higher, and as you play lower, the MIDI note numbers get lower. So C sharp 3 would be 61, D3 would be 62, A440 is 69, the C below middle C would be 48, and so forth and so on. So with pitch numbers ranging from 0 to 127, there are actually more MIDI note numbers than there are keys on an 88 key piano or MIDI controller. So the first data byte defines the pitch, but what does the second data byte define? Well, it defines the velocity. Remember that velocity is not necessarily how hard you press the key, but rather how fast you press the key. Generally speaking, most instruments use velocity to control the dynamic of the sound. So higher velocities are generally louder, and lower velocities are generally softer. So that's the note on message. The status byte defines the message, the first data byte defines the pitch as a 0 to 127 value, and the second data byte defines the velocity as another 0 to 127 value. This is where those 0 to 127 values come from that you commonly see in music programming. 
Now, what about the note off message? I'm kind of lumping this in as the same type of message as note on, but note off is actually its own separate message. When you release a key on your MIDI controller, this still sends a three byte message. The status byte defines that it's a note off message. The first data byte defines the pitch and the second data byte sends a note off velocity. So how quickly or slowly do you release the key? In most situations, the note off velocity doesn't really matter because all it takes to stop the playback of a note is the note off message in the pitch. However, there are some rare situations where note off velocity can be used to control additional expression and effects. Next, let's break down control change messages or CC messages for short. CC messages are generally broken up into two different types, continuous controllers, things like faders, knobs, the modulation wheel, and switch controllers like the sustain pedal. But the way the information is conveyed in the MIDI message is the same, regardless of whether it's a continuous controller or a switch controller. And I should point out that the term CC is often used to refer to all continuous controllers or all control change messages. So sometimes the terminology is different from person to person. With all control change messages, the status byte defines the type of message, a control change message. The first data byte defines what controller you're moving. For example, modulation wheel is CC number one, sustain pedal is CC 64, and every single knob or fader on your MIDI controller has a separate CC number associated with it. Now in modern MIDI production, most CCs are just general purpose controllers that can be paired to anything. For example, I can pair this knob with a filter and a synthesizer and create this effect. Or I can pair this fader with a tremolo effect. The parameter that the CC is paired to can really be anything in your DAW, but with hardware synthesizers, CCs are generally paired to certain effects. If you go to MIDI.org and look up the MIDI 1.0 control change messages list, you'll see the default assignments for each of the 128 control functions. So again, CC1 is mod wheel, 64 is damper pedal or sustain pedal. But what about these other ones? CC2 is breath controller. Well, this is actually a headset controller you can blow into and it senses the air pressure and converts it to zero to 127 control data. And it can be used to control the dynamic of instruments in your DAW. CC4 is foot controller, seven is channel volume, 10 is pan, 11 is expression controller, and so forth and so on. The CC list isn't showing the only thing these CCs can be used for, but rather the default assignment for each of these CCs. In modern DAWs, where we primarily use software instruments, just about any CC can be paired with any effect. So the CC number is not quite as important in software as it is on hardware. What's more important is the second data byte value, which designates the position of the CC. So for example, with mod wheel, if we push this all the way up, that's 127. All the way down is zero. Likewise, with faders, all the way up is 127, down is zero. With knobs, all the way to the left is zero, all the way to the right is 127. And with switches like sustain pedal, if you press the switch, it's 127. If you release the switch, it's zero. So this CC positional data can be written into Logic or any other DAW as MIDI automation, which we will also cover in this course. The last type of MIDI message I want to break down is the pitch bend message. The reason why pitch bend is not a control change message is because our ears are more sensitive to pitch changes than they are to things like volume, filter position, panning, etc. So the reason why pitch bend is its own MIDI message is because it requires a higher resolution than MIDI 1.0 can handle, at least for one data byte. With pitch bend messages, the status byte defines the message as pitch bend, and both data bytes work together in tandem as a dual layered MIDI message to convey the positional data of the pitch bend wheel. So instead of 0 to 127, it's actually 0 to 127 times 0 to 127, or 128 times 128, giving you 16,384 discrete positions for pitch bend. And if you split that in half, that's 8,192 positions from the center point up and 8,192 positions from the center point down. 
So because PitchBend has a much higher resolution than any continuous controller, this allows for smooth, fluid motion with no noticeable zipper effect. One last topic I want to talk about is MIDI timing and synchronization. MIDI uses two different systems of synchronizing devices and software. The first is MIDI timecode, or MTC, and the second, and more important, at least in terms of music programming, is called MIDI Beat Clock. MIDI timecode is similar to SEMTI timecode. It's a continuously running synchronization system that keeps track of timing and playback of devices and software in hours, minutes, seconds, frames, and quarter frames. MIDI Beat Clock synchronizes the timing and playback of devices and software in bars, beats, and ticks within a set tempo. You know what bars and beats are already, but a tick is a tiny subdivision of a beat. And in MIDI 1.0, there are 960 ticks per beat. That was actually a new thing that was introduced in the early 90s with the general MIDI specification. Prior to 1991, each beat only had 24 ticks or 24 subdivisions. Beat Clock is responsible for determining the placement of MIDI notes on the grid in your DAW. When a note is on bar five, beat three, and tick 441, for example, this is describing the relative synchronization of that note on the grid. But if I quantize that note to the nearest quarter note, for example, it's going to change its relative position on the grid, moving to bar five, beat three, tick one. So MIDI quantization and other tempo synced effects like arpeggiators and note repeaters, for example, rely on MIDI beat clock to synchronize the playback of MIDI notes on the grid. So I like to think of time code as like a fixed or absolute synchronization system and beat clock as like a relative synchronization system. For example, exactly one minute of playback at 120 BPM will put you at bar 31, beat one, tick one. However, if I change the tempo to say 96.25 BPM, the one minute mark is now at bar 25, beat one, tick 241. So MIDI beat clock and the MIDI grid in your DAW have the ability to expand and shrink to fit the tempo of the project, whereas time code is just a fixed synchronization system that doesn't adapt to the tempo. Okay, so that is an overview of MIDI, MIDI messages, and MIDI message structure. I promise this will be the last lecture type video for a while, and you can continue on to part 37, where we'll dive into MIDI recording and comping techniques. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel to see more content like this. As always, thank you so much for the support and thanks for watching.